everyone, and welcome to Marketing and Sales Over Cocktails, the weekly podcast that helps you grow your business, improve your life, and enjoy yourself along the way. I'm your host, Alan Langer, and every week we try to bring you the best thought leaders, the best business leaders, and the best minds out there to help you succeed in business and in life. So sit back, relax, grab your pad, your pen, and your favorite beverage, and enjoy the next episode of Marketing and Sales Over Cocktails. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Marketing and Sales Over Cocktails. This is your host, Alan Langer. This is episode 11. We are flying along here with one great episode after another. It doesn't stop tonight. I've got a great guest for you coming up. But before I introduce that, I'm going to introduce a little little twist tonight. We've got a new little segment I'm going to have at the end of the show. I've been getting some emails from folks, and they've been asking me to answer some questions. So I'm going to turn that into a, a basically a weekly segment called Ask Alan. And when the this question comes in, I'll try to answer it, but I'm also going to put my guest on the spot and have him or her answer it as well. So we've got our first question tonight. That's coming up at the end of the podcast, so stick around for that. So without delaying any further, episode number 11, we are graced with the awesome Marcus Chan. And did I pronounce your name correctly? Is it Chan or Chan? Chan, he nailed it perfectly, right? It's Chan. super easy. That's Perfect. You nailed it. Exactly. Well, it. Marcus Chan joins us, and Marcus is uh, one of those LinkedIn like super duper like you know. <laughs> <laughs> he he's like one of those guys that everybody knows on LinkedIn, and I met him on LinkedIn. I meet most of my guests on LinkedIn, but he's like a sales guru. He's only thirty six years old, but what he's done in his past is pretty pretty impressive. So I would get a pen and a pad tonight and and pay attention because I think he's going to drop some nuggets that you're really really going to like. So. I'll do a quick bio, but I'm going to let him talk about himself because he's a lot better at it than I am. But what Marcus does, he has a, uh, I think the name of his company is Venley Consulting, correct? Nailed it. It's a made-up word. Sign the the real word. It's perfect. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to ask you about that in a second. On his his profile link, it says, uh, sell more, sell better, free B2B sales community. Join his free B2B sales community. That's one of the other things that attracted me to him was... Uh, he's got this huge Facebook sell, selling community, correct? So mm-hmm. yep. um, he's just he's just one of the things that is really cool is like he he's going to help you sell better without a lot of experience, which is what I think is cool. A lot of people think that in order to become good at sales, you have to be doing it for fifteen years, and I don't believe that. You certainly don't believe it. So mm-hmm. let's get into this. First of all, Marcus Chan, welcome to the podcast tonight. Thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for, so much for having me on. I really really appreciate it. And I think you flatter me too much because I'm definitely. No guru, just a guy who has made lots of mistakes. That's all. Lots of mistakes. So Yeah, but you know what? You're making the mistakes for all of us and you and you'll help us hopefully not make the same mistakes going forward. So That's right. So we start I start my podcast by telling the audience what I'm having and I'm having an old overholt rye whiskey on the rocks. I feel like uh, I I'm becoming a lush because this Mark is my third guest who doesn't drink, so I might just call it marketing and sales over coffee or something in the future, but right now Totally fine. Yeah. So anyway, so let's get into this, Marcus. L- let's talk about, um, y- you have, uh, I was looking at your bio and stuff and, and you, you kind of skyrocketed through your career. Like you were, you were promoted 10 times over 10 years. Give us a little background on what makes you, you know, how you got to where you are and so successful in selling and, and how you can train that. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Right. And you know, I think the reality is, is uh, I believe those who achieve the most typically have made the most mistakes. They, they usually fail forward, right? And, you know, and the thing is, when I first graduated and I was going into the corporate world to get a, get a job doing B2B sales, I really wasn't sure if I'd be made out for sales. I really didn't know, okay? And, and when I graduated, this is 2007, when I first started outside sales in which my parents were very resistant of me doing that type of thing because they wanted me to be either a doctor, a lawyer, a counselor, or something along those lines. <laughs> I did none of those things and went into sales. But I went into it because, uh, not because it was sales, because it was a startup division of a major company. And I saw the opportunity to grow something to be awesome. And that was a huge uh, rule for me. That was very appealing, that purpose of building something from scratch. So with that being said, I jumped into uh, B2B sales and there was no training. There were, my boss had never done a job before. I did get a manual that was like probably like two inches thick, written by people who had never done the job before either. What, right? what, was, what was the company selling? 
Uh, so it was a company called, it was Enterprise Rent a Car. And oh, they okay. had, a, a, it was a truck <laughs> division. It was a brand new subdivision. So they, they literally had, so they had no clients. They, they had already invested all this money to buy a fleet of box trucks, pickup trucks, et cetera. So my job was to go get corporate clients to rent and lease our vehicles. Now, I'm like, okay, that sounds kind of cool, right? Yep. Now, I only had four zip codes and then the economy started falling apart, right? Because it's 2007. So businesses were already shutting down. So when they're not moving products, they're not renting box trucks to move products. They're not renting steak beds or anything to move product at all, right? And uh, I remember when I started, wow. my, my, my first day, I get that manual, which is written again by people that never sold before. And my boss says, hey, I want you to go and knock on doors. I said, okay, like, what do I say? What do I do? He's like, just go out there and try to sell them on spot. I'm like, sell what? I didn't know what to do. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he gives me a stack of business cards, his business cards, because mine weren't even ordered yet, right? And I'm like, how many doors should I go knock on? He's like, I want you to knock on at least 30 doors. I'm like, okay. So I literally walked out of the building and just started walking down the street, hitting as many businesses as possible. Now, and you're trying day, to sell box truck rentals walking yes. in front of, in, into, into business. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's something that people probably don't need either. <laughs> right, right, right. So I, that day, I walked into 60 businesses, booked zero points, closed zero deals. And I'm like, right. oh, man. That's why I'm like, this job is really hard. All right. <laughs> Next day, I did again, knock on 60 more doors, zero prospects, zero closed deals, zero uh, appointments booked. Wow. At this point, I walked into over 120 businesses by foot and I'm freaking out now because I'm like, oh man, like, like this job is really hard. Like <laughs> how can I have less than a 1% conversion to even a book appointment? That's, that sounds crazy to me, right? right. So eventually fast forward, I made tons of mistakes and uh, eventually figured out how to sell effectively. Within three months, I became number one. And then uh, from there, I stayed, I stayed number one every single month and then was promoted multiple times as well. But I made a lot of mistakes along the way, right? Yeah. From, you know, failing at leadership, failing at teaching people. And, you know, over time, when you, when you learn how to reprogram your brain to ask better questions, you start learning a different way. So for example, right? Like mm-hmm. most of the time when someone gets their face smashed in by a prospect on the phones or on a cold call, if you can't see door to door, after a while, people are like, oh, why is it so hard? Mm-hmm. Why, is it, why are people so mean to me? Why won't they say yes? Why is the economy bad? Why is my boss a jerk? Why won't they train? You start blaming all these other people. And I did mm-hmm. that too. Yeah. Then I started learning how to rewire my brain. And I literally would start asking myself better questions. So I asked myself questions like, okay, hold on. Obviously, I felt terrible. But what can I learn from this? Mm-hmm. How, how can I take what I learned and apply it? How can I... What can I do upfront to eliminate and minimize my risk for the future? And by thinking that way, in every type of t- tough situation, I would learn and then I would try and I would apply. And ultimately, by refining over, over time, I had better results, right? Yep. And by asking myself these better questions, and I applied to every single role I've been in, right? And that allowed me to get promoted pretty quickly and get massive results. I mean, I got promoted 10 times in 10 years and I only worked for two Fortune 500 companies, right? In my last role, I was leading an organization uh, for the last four years. My last promotion, I led team for four years. Uh, my, I had 110 employees over multiple states, and we did mm-hmm. nine figures a year in revenue, right? right? And it was no accident I got there, but I made a lot of mistakes. But then when I make mistakes, I'm always looking, how can I learn from this and make it, make it so I can learn from this situation and not have it happen again? And when you think that way, your, your life changes, right? And most people are just not intentional with their actions. Most people live a very unconscious life, meaning they kind of go through things, things happen, they're like, oh, that happened. Oh, missed quota. Oh, this happened. Oh, you know, lost this deal. Versus when you're conscious, you're consciously thinking and being mindful, how can I change what happened? I can, I can literally stop the podcast right now <laughs> and everyone, what you just heard, I would say is in the top three things you'll ever learn in selling. Because I went through the same epiphany you did years and years ago. Now, you were B2B. I was B2C. I was in home sales, which some would argue is, is it's just a different level of difficult. Oh, yeah. And one call closed. You know, they, the companies wanted you to get in there. They're not sending you back. You don't close it. You, lo- you lose that customer. Yeah. And, and when I started getting better is when I would leave an appointment without a sale. And mm-hmm. normally, you'd be like, ah, yeah freaking customer. They suck. They don't have any money yeah. or this is a crappy appointment or a terrible lead or the house was bad. You're blaming everything else. 
mm-hmm. I would pull over about a mile away and I'm like, what did I do wrong or what could I yes. have done better? That's it. And that's when I started, I turned everything around. And that's mm-hmm. what I used to train people. I, I would go on, on ride along with reps and they would do the same mm-hmm. thing. I, why, I would ask them, why, you didn't, why didn't you sell that? Well, mm-hmm. they, they didn't have the money. It was always the customer's right. fault, never right. their own. So that, that piece of advice, uh, I mean, people who are listening, write that down. Mm-hmm. You know, so great, uh-huh. great stuff. And, and, and um, so now that you're doing that, so, so is that what, so tell me what you do now in Venley Consulting. Is that what you train? You, you train people how to sell? You have a process or what, what, what does your basic training entail? Yeah, great question, right? So um, it was interesting is, so like, you know, even though my company is like a consulting and coaching company, majority of my people go through my digital programs, right? So okay. um, so I've actually built, so it's a program called Six Figure Sales Academy. And I've actually built, it's, it's, I've now converted, I'm actually on the fourth edition, but it, what it is, it's a comprehensive A to Z step-by-step training for B2B sales professionals from, it goes from mindset to prospecting to running the discovery calls, to cl- presenting, closing, handling objects, and growing the account. And essentially mm-hmm. what I've done is, I mean, I've literally, because I've, I've literally have interviewed and hired like thousands of people, right? Mm-hmm. And I have found even the top ones very rarely have real good field proven training. Mm-hmm. So I, I basically taken everything I've trained and developed over the years, allowed me to basically repeat my success and I put into a digital program step by step. And since I'm actually on the fourth edition now, at every edition, the more students get in the program, the more I get the feedback and the questions, and I take notes to refine for the next version. So, so this, this is like a digital. This is like a digital training people that people sign oh, yeah. up for, and they go through it at their own pace. Or is it like a is it like a module that goes from you know you got to do it in four weeks? How does it work? So it's, uh, it's all step-by-step. Step. It is at your own pace, right? Okay. So what, they get lifetime access. So whether they go in and they, they want to binge watch it, which I don't really recommend because you really want, it's, it's about mastery, not about absorbing knowledge, right? And yeah, I talk yeah, yeah, about yeah. How, do you, how do you actually implement it, right? So it's, it's very step-by-step. Step. Like, I literally say, okay, now go do this. Yep. Now go do this, right? right? right. Now I've now have built into a comprehensive, uh, it's a group coaching program as well. So now the program also includes automatically group coaching every single week so I can really tackle any specific questions that maybe for their industry or for their situation that we just do a little bit of tweaking to make sure it fits properly into their style. Wow. But it's been, so uh, it's so been people though. sign up and they get, they get the course and then they get you once a week in a group setting to answer their questions one-on-one. Yeah. So they, get, they really get like three big chunks. Again, number one, they get the uh, step-by-step training, which is a very comprehensive A to yep. Z training. They also get with that, uh, they get uh, every script, every template, every form, every document, step by step for the whole thing, right? Wow. Uh, so it's just it's scalable. And then from there, they get the weekly group coaching with me. Yep. And then they also get, on top of that, they also get a private Facebook group as well. So they can ask all the questions, et cetera, that maybe they can't wait till the following week. You know, I got this big deal here, or I'm really frustrated with this situation. How do you approach it, right? So it's designed to give you the step by step while giving you the support to maximize your performance. The community, too. yeah, you get the community is so important. Yep, absolutely. I joined a community. You know Alex Sheridan on LinkedIn, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Alex is great. And he has a he has a video boot camp that I became involved in. But what he did was is what you did. He created a community. So you know we're always chatting almost every day. People are like pumping yep. each other up, like, "Oh, great video!" Or I would suggest this. It's really good. So wow, that's that's. That's awesome stuff. So I'd, I'd encourage at the end of this, we're going to tell people how you, how they can take, take a look and take, you know, uh, take a look at that and maybe join up because totally. if I was, if I was a young rep, I'd be or an old rep. I'd, I'd join up totally right, yeah. right away. We so, have people brand new to 20, 30 years experience. They all see can never stop world. learning, right? They do it. Can 100%. never stop learning. So you said something back there that you and I chatted with probably last week about you can buy, and you, and you had a post on this, and it was a brilliant post because you said you used to read 100 books a year, whatever it was, and you That's realized crazy. I was just absorbing knowledge, but I wasn't taking action on any of the knowledge. Mm-hmm. And that is such, a, is such an important thing to do. Like When I wrote my book, and the end of the book, it's kind of like a motivational type of chapter. Mm-hmm. And, and what I said to, in my book is like, this is not the end of the book. This is the beginning right here. 
this right. may be the end of the book, but if you don't do anything with the last 231 pages you just read, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. And 94% right. of people that buy self-help programs and books right. never complete them. 94%, it's a real number. And the 6% mm-hmm. that do are the most successful people in the world. So t- talk about that and, 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 and what happened with you on a personal level and what you think about that. Yeah. So, um, you know, early on, you know, like I had, you know, heard leaders are readers. You know, I read a stat somewhere yeah. like the average CEO reads a book a week or something like that. Right. Right. So I'm like, I should do the same thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and growing up. So <clears throat> English is actually my second language. And I actually grew up with a speech impediment. I actually didn't start speaking until I was four years old. So actually I go through like wow. speech therapy for years and all these things uh, because I really, really struggled. Now, one great thing that came out of it was early on, I read a lot of books. I read a lot of books, right? Because, you know, one, I was like, because I was slower at learning, you know, like I didn't have many friends. Like I made fun of as a kid, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, like books became my friend and I would read tons of books as a kid growing up. That's kind of what happened, right? Now, over time, I was able to combat it, right? And get better. And I still have a speech impediment that still kicks in even to this day, but it's a little less noticeable. Mm-hmm. However, I still continue to read. And, you know, and when I got into outside sales, when I was really struggling, you know, like when I, when I was struggling making cold calls, struggling to get results, the first thing I did, which was recommended to me by my girlfriend, now wife, but at the time my girlfriend, she's like, hey, you should read some books to help you sell better if you're having issues. So I went to a library and then literally got every single sales book that was like available. You know, Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, Augmented, every single sales book. And I read voraciously for like weeks in a row, as many as possible, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would apply, I kind of try to apply here and there, right? And I did this for a while. That's where I started. I then I came across personal development and I started obsessing about it, right? And then yeah. for, as I started having success, I was implementing some things, not, but not a lot. I continued to read like a, like a crazy amount. Because at that time, you start realizing all the things you don't know. Like you, you graduate thinking you're like super smart, but yep. then you realize you don't know a single thing about the life, right? And <laughs> I'm going, I'm reading all these books. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, like my mind's gonna, gonna expose to all these things. I'm reading all these incredible books. And, um, but I wasn't, my perspective was changing, but my actions were worse. So as I encounter different things, I was trying to learn about, right? I'm like, okay, you know what? Now I'm leading people. I better start reading leadership books, right? Yep. And there's, yep. Thousands of leadership books, right? And I want to learn about investing in all these things. And it was probably like, I was probably like 24, I was about at least a couple of years in of reading heavily. And also the other thing I would do as well, which was I would go, and this is when books on CD were still, you know, around, right? Yeah, yeah. And I would get the CDs at the library and I would listen to them on my commute. I had a long commute. So I would consume books that way as well. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't applying it, right? And then at 24, like, I just, I just suddenly was like, what am I doing? Like, like someone, someone asked me like, Hey, listen, like, what's your favorite book? And I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, because I'm like, what's your most recent one you read? And I'm like, I read a lot. I don't yeah. remember why I read last week, but, and that was like a, a realization. I'm like, Oh my God. Like I'm literally unconsciously reading books. I'm yeah, unconsciously yeah, yeah. observing or, you know, absorbing if I thought, right? right. So I decided to make a shift. And at that point, I'm like, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get, uh, if I get, when I get an audio book, like the CD, I'm just going to listen to it like at least like a few times in a row. And because I was driving so often, I can listen to an audio book, like, like a, a, like a seven, eight hour audio book. I can listen to four or five times in a month easily. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I started, I started doing that. And then I started like just reading, like just taking my time to reading books. So like hard copy books take me maybe. A month to read one. I just take my time to really read and digest. And I wouldn't read in big chunks. I'll read like, you know, 10, 15 minutes a night, right? And just kind of slowly digest it. Mm-hmm. And then at the time, I was still working. I wasn't as dialed as I am today with it, but I didn't have a way to really take the notes and put it in a way to apply, right? Mm-hmm. Eventually I figured it out. I learned, I taught myself a better system, but at the time, I could at least do little things here and there. So I started applying certain things. So for example, at that time when I realized it, I started getting really into uh, investing, right? So okay. I started reading really, and, and I really didn't do a good job with my 401k, Roth IRAs, didn't know anything about stocks or mutual funds. And I started to research and study it. And I started making small changes, like just automated changes, mm-hmm. right? And after six months, my net worth skyrocketed 25%. And wow. that was like a, 
whoa. Right. <laughs> like, because I'm actually applying these things, like, yeah, it's yeah, actually yeah. making me better, right? And I've, I've done the same thing with leadership and other things that I'm trying to put my skills on and other sales books I've picked up on, on the way as well. And that was a really major aha, right? And then over time, I figured out better, a better system for from taking what I learned and putting it right into practice because that was the thing. Like, people read books and they might take a lot of notes in the book, but how many are doing something beyond taking notes on the book? Right. Many are not. Many are not. Absolutely. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to subconsciously start doing this. No, you're not. Right. There's no <laughs> way you can do it. You have habits in place that you, you've already mapped out in your neural pathways in your brain that you need to map new ways of thinking. You need, you need to map a new way to take action. And that takes intention. And you need a system to do that. Otherwise, it won't get done. Absolutely. And you know, w- with my book, which is The Seven Secrets, when I, when I train people with The Seven Secrets, they're everybody always, 100% of the time, like, all right, I want to apply all seven secrets. I'm ready to go. I'm like, no, no, no. Look, we're going to train you on secret one, and then you're going to go do that for a week. And we're yes. going to go to number two. And you're gonna, you can't just read all seven. Like, you're going to read the whole book, but then do a chapter and stop and right. then apply it. And, that's, and it. that's when it's effective. Because you have to mm-hmm. practice. You have to say, okay, 100%. you can't just read and say, oh, okay, now I'm going to be a, uh, an 80% closer tomorrow because I'm going to do It doesn't work that way. Right, right, right. <laughs> it took, me, right, it took right. me 27 years to figure this shit out. So, <laughs> Right, right, exactly. Right? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's great stuff. So tell me, so you talked about, I'm going to get to the question in a little while where, you know, we've, we've got some time to chat, but the question is about prospecting. You mentioned prospecting, so we're going to hold that off. But give me like, let's say we're, we, got, we got a bunch of different people listening to this podcast from rookies to hopefully some, some veterans. Give me like two nuggets that you would give one to a rookie and one to a veteran from a selling standpoint in B2B. What would you, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but what would, you, what, okay. what, what would be a nugget that you would give to a rookie and then to a veteran? Yeah. So if it was a rookie, so if it was a rookie, the first thing I would say is, Build out the perfect routine that's going to generate 80% of your results, right? And, and what I mean by that is a, a lot of times when you are brand new, you don't realize all your unconscious habits you have and you are unintentional with your routine. And so a lot of what ends up happening is reps kind of fl- float day by day, not sure what's going to happen. They don't have a planned out day for Monday. So then maybe Tuesday is going to be a little bit better. And then before you know, it's Friday and then right. Friday, take it easy. And they, then suddenly they miss quota and they're wondering why they miss quota. Mm-hmm. Well, the, tr- the reality is, is a lot of times they don't have a plan to schedule for the week, right? So if you are a rookie, you want to uncover, you want to be crystal clear exactly what your IPAs are, your income producing activities. Yes. I and you that. literally want to make sure you map out your entire week. Right from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, exactly what your day and week's going to look like, right? And that should involve your personal stuff and also your work stuff, having the IPAs during your work hours. Mm -hmm. And if you're not mapped out that way, it's not going to happen. So you have to crystal clear. So, for example, if you if you if you're in a role that needs heavy prospecting, it probably should be majority of your week. You know, like you just need more prospecting, but you, right. it was not going to happen unless you, you build into your part of your calendar and routine. So right. build that out and be fully aware of it, right? And then from there, then you can make tweaks here and then improve, right? And it starts with being a fully aware of knowing what your IPAs are and being crystal clear. That. That's the first thing I would do. Because if, if you can and, do that, your results are going to come. And, and let, me, let me stop you there because that, that term, income producing activity, is such an important one, especially for the younger, the younger reps that you're talking about. And I was speaking to an executive coach who's part of my networking group, and she's been on the podcast, Brittany Droz. And, and she said something to me that hit home, and it even affected me. And, I, and I'm pretty good at scheduling my day. She's like, think about if you're doing something, mm-hmm. and that, that, that task doesn't either make you money or advance your career, do something else. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you're right. Like if I'm sitting here and all of a sudden, you, you know, everyone, you all of a sudden you're on Instagram before you even know it, you're looking at this. Wait a minute, this isn't helping my career. This isn't making me money. And, and it could be just uh, 60 seconds. But if you realize you're doing it and it's, it's not an income producing activity, you need to change it. And that is such an important mm-hmm. point you just made. Yes, yes, yes. And so, uh, if, yeah, go ahead. If no, you so, are, so keep going. So if you're, if you're a more seasoned rep, 
right? And yeah. I'm going to challenge the season rep to really know their numbers inside and out, right? And, and what I mean by that specifically is, uh, are you crystal clear exactly how many presentations you need to go on to close X number of deals you want to get to, okay? So understanding your inputs to your outputs, right? But then how to improve it. How do you improve either the closing ratio or the number of presentations, right? Or your deal size and get super granular, right? Mm -hmm. Because often what I find as you become more successful in sales, you start relaxing a little bit and you start cutting some corners. So for example, if early on you would push for three to four no's on the phone and then give up, are you still doing that today? Or are you giving them after two no's? When you're in that appointment and you're presenting and going through with them, and are you pushing for four, three, four, five no's? Or are you getting one or two and then just kind of like, I'm good because I've already closed the other deal this week or this month. Right. 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 And it's really pushing past what uh, has become normal for you, that, stag- that stagnation that develops naturally as a result. And here's the thing. Sometimes your boss will do it, but depending on your boss, they may not do it, right? And they might be comfortable too. But if you push yourself to be uncomfortable and take a look at what, where are your goals at right now? If you're making 200 grand a year, can you push yourself to 250? If you're making 250, can you push it to 400? Making 400, can you push it to 500, right? Right. Do that by making those little tweaks in the game. Because especially once you get to being more seasoned and tenured, you'll ne- it's never usually one big thing that's going to change your game. It's going to be the game of inches that you can tweak a little bit that's going to give you a maximum result, especially when you're seasoned and tenured. Yeah. And I think the one thing I would add to that is, is sales is such a numbers game. And I did a post re- regarding this that I think a lot of reps get caught up in the numbers too much. And they're like, you know, all right, well, if I see 50 people, I'll close, I'll close 21. And that's consistent. But maybe you should, instead of seeing 50 people, maybe you should see 35 really good people. Like maybe mm-hmm. you should really qualify your, your leads better than you have been if you're doing yes. this. I so, totally agree, right? Yeah. And what's interesting is, and I love that you brought that up, right? Because like, I think a lot of times people can interpret numbers in a couple different ways. Yeah. Like some people interpret as see more people, close more people, right? Right. You know, like, and that's, that's one way to look at it, right? Which I don't necessarily agree with because you're right. If it's a hundred, you know, unqualified prospects, you're wasting yeah, your time. You some, it's a waste of your time. You're, yeah. you're frustrated, you're annoyed. Yep. But if you look at the other part of the numbers game, which is your conversion ratio, right? Right. That's a better number. Or your deal size, right? right. Like, right. okay, maybe you see 35, but your deal size is larger, right? Yep. And you have a better closing ratio. So you can offset it, right? Because you can spend a little more time preparing for that, you right? Know? And there's a lot of magic. It's kind of it's like this, right? So uh, I was never one of those guys that thought it made sense to make 100 dials and book like five, six appointments. That didn't make any sense to me, right? right. Like, so I made sure my lists were so nails that I only needed 40, 40 50 dials and I'd book 10 appointments. Exactly. Right? And the only exactly. reason they wouldn't book is simply because they didn't answer. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> you know, like, but they were better quality, better qualified, and I had more research. And I was hunting with a sniper rifle versus a shotgun. Yes. You know? but the shotgun yep. is well, where are you out. The sniper rifle, you can go for a long time. Yeah. I, I, and I remember when I was a really young rep and I, and I, and I was selling uh, windows and doors. For a, for a home improvement company. It was just, it was a kind of a, a larger company. It was just terrible. All they cared about was just, you know, churn yeah. and burn the appointments. And the whole group, this is how pathetic it was. Like the whole group, there was a, the, the regional manager came in and there was a hundred of us in a room. And then they brought the guy in from Atlanta and all he did was yell at us for an hour. Yeah. And all he kept saying was, you know, sales is a numbers game. You see as many, you see more people, you'll close more deals. And then he said, this blew me away. You got to do the same exact pitch word for word in front of everyone you see, the same one. And I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> well, yeah. this is an analytical customer. This is a, an right. amiable customer. I'm going to do the same exact sales, but it doesn't make any right. sense. Right. And that's what they right. were training. Yeah. And I, and I think here's what's scary, right? Um, now, I never sold SaaS, right? And I see a lot of, a lot of same stuff in SaaS now. Right? Yeah. Like they're driving the nut. I'm like, this is like super old school. Like this doesn't make sense. You're holding these SDRs to these metrics that literally incentivize the wrong behaviors. Like yes. you're saying, make calls, make calls, make calls, and book appointments, book appointments, but they're not quality appointments. Right, so right. You get, you get these junky, unqualified ones, and then you wonder why they're missing quota, mm-hmm. right? But then you also don't give them any training, 
to have me better on the phones, you know, like, does it make any right. sense? And, you know? and, and, and then, you know, the, the, the reps who, who have a, a beef if they're running the appointments and mm-hmm. they suck, but you can't really complain about the leads because <laughs> then you're ba- blaming the lead. So you, right. You, you're right. It's just the whole concept that if it's just based on numbers, it just doesn't work. It, it produces 25 to 30% closing sales teams. That's what it does. hundred percent. Yeah. So, all right. So we are at about 35 minutes. So we're, we're moving along. So let's get into prospecting a little bit. So you're B2B, which is mm-hmm. all about prospecting. And I, and oh, I yeah. cut my teeth in B2C. And I, I argue that B2C, a lot of B2C, uh, I call them lead babies. A lot of B2C salespeople, they sit on the couch and they wait for the lead to come in from the company. And when you want to get to, <laughs> if you want to be a really good B2C you know, sales rep, you get out there and you find your own consumers. Yes. Um, yes. So it's a little B2B mentality that you can take it. So, so take, me, take me through some of your prospecting tips. And then that's going to bring me up to the question, which is what I'll ask now. So, so segment number one, drum roll, uh, ask Al and ask his guest. I got this from Tiffany. She wrote in, uh, what is your tip? Basic question. What is your mm-hmm. biggest tip for prospecting? So there you mm. go. I'm going to let you answer that one. Perfect, right? I'm going to have a, a two-part answer to this, okay? Oh, I love it. Go ahead. So the first part, and this is where I see one of the biggest mistakes that many reps make is they are not crystal clear on their target market. So they are out there blanket firing into the abyss, <laughs> hoping they can make calls or emails or DMs and hopefully land somewhere, right? Yep. And I, I cause it, and it's still happening until the, like right now. Like literally, I get these emails that I know someone bought my information and it literally has nothing to do with me. Mm-hmm. And they're sending it to me, trying to prospect me, right? And that's it's because they're not crystal clear the target market, right? So it, it's, it's, it, I think it's as simple as this, right? Like you have to imagine that all the products that are out there are a certain type of fish. They all want different types of bait. Like if you put a worm on a hook and you're trying to hunt sharks, nothing's going to happen. Like <laughs> you're not going to get the sharks, right? <laughs> right? So number one, figure out exactly who your target market is, you know? And I'm not, I'm not just talking about the demographics, like, oh, they're between like ages like 22 to 35 and, you know, they are a male or female living. No, 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 no. I'm talking about psychographics. You want to understand the needs, the wants, the desires, the pains, the heartburns, and exactly what goes on in the mind of your target market prospect. And when you can do that, this allows you to be better at catering your messaging from phones to emails to DMs to a TikTok message to however you want to prospect them more effectively. Because now you are using the right bait to catch them. Yes. So if you know you're hunting sharks, you need to have a bunch of like, I don't know, like sardines or something or whatever that you need to get <laughs> sharks, right? You're using the right bait. So you can you're use the, the right body bait. of the sales rep who died trying to prospect the wrong to f- fish for the sharks. <laughs> totally, totally. And, and by trying to play a numbers game of trying to like do more emails, do more dials, you might get a little bit better conversion, but it's not going to be much. But once you know exactly who, who they are, and their heartburns, then you can also, you also know their potential objections too. <laughs> like, right. So then you can get around it, right? right? So that's the first part of the tip. That's the first piece because the second piece does not work well if you don't know the first piece. The first piece is know your target market. There are psychographics, okay? Love the it. second part of this tip is going to be use video as much as you can, especially in your initial outreach, right? And, uh, and, I don't, I don't, you could do obviously content market, but I'm talking about your initial outreach to them. Aside from the phone call, which phones are not dead, they're still very much alive. If you are doing a LinkedIn DM, an email, utilizing video is so powerful in gaining their attention, but it has to be a personalized video to that prospect. So for example, let's say you're, if you shoot off a cold email, in your video, right, that you, sh- you send off to them, it should be you saying hi to them, to their name. You're saying, hey, Alan, Marcus here with ABC. Like you literally are saying their name within a few seconds. Yep. All right. Super impactful, right? And, and that's part of your outreach. And when you're using video like that, we, we talk about how you actually structure the email, all that stuff too. But when you, when you use that personalization, they now realize 
they are not just another like, you know, email blast to a thousand leads about somewhere. They know it's direct to them. Now, a little, little tip specifically, if it's email. So if you're using something like BB mail or video or some other software to do that, you're going to want to include a screenshot in there as well in the email. And in that screenshot, you want to make sure it's like you holding like a, a whiteboard with their name or it says, hi, Alan, you know, so they know. Right. It's custom to them. Okay. And now it's probably that screenshot. And then your copy in the email has to reference that as well, just in case the image does not show up because they have some sort of, you know, high security email a client that right. prevents it from happening. So when they see the customized email, it's personalized too, it's hyper personalized in that video, you are now opening the door to a better conversation. The same if it's a LinkedIn DM, even better. Oh, yeah. Because now that LinkedIn DM is direct to them. They can hear it, they can see it. And it's personalized. You can do native in the app. And it's so powerful from cutting through the noise and gain trust very quickly. You have a higher conversion rate, open rate, everything rate as a result of that personalized video in the DM or email. That's how we got to talk. I sent you a, a video DM yeah. and you responded right away. 100%. Yeah. Because I respect yeah. them. Like, it, it's hard to do. Yeah. Many people will say, sure, it sounds like a good idea, but they don't do it. Yeah. Right? They don't even do, most, of them, most people don't even do the voice DMs, let alone the video ones. Oh yeah. And, oh yeah. At the very minimal, you should be doing a voice DM. Don't type it. Typing is like, I never type a DM anymore. Hard, I mean, ever, unless it's like, yeah. you know, okay or something. But other than that. So yeah, I, have a, nice. I have a whole strategy with the text too. I mean, there's a whole, even the LinkedIn DM, I literally, it's a video, personalized video. Yeah. And then my text is a quick summary of what I said. Because okay. sometimes I found if there's somewhere like maybe it's loud, it was more so when before COVID, when people were in offices, so they couldn't yeah, like yeah, always yeah. play it. So they, they were like messaging me like, oh, I'll, I'll watch your video later. And then they forget, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So now my things is, hey, like when my video set up top, you know, then I, I reference everything else. Oh, so, that's a good idea. I didn't think about that. A little, little, little hack around it, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the audio message is different too, because the audio message, like, you, you're still a little unsure, right? Yeah, you're yeah. You're still a little unsure, you know? But it's but it's still better than an initial text going oh, to- out. Totally, totally. Yeah. When they yeah. when they can see my goofy face in the video, though, they're like, "Oh, this dude! Oh, yeah. Like, all right, exactly. I can talk to this guy." You know. So so there is software that can personalize uh, uh, emails to. So you can do a video, say, "Hey, Marcus, this is Alan from you know, marketing and sales over cocktails, blah yeah. blah blah," and that would go out to a hundred people, and it would just change the first name of everyone. Well, so you mean, have you, to do it individually you, you, yourself. You, you do individually stuff. Okay, right? gotcha, like, okay. I would still recommend individually. Yeah, okay. Because because there's something power when they hear their name. Like, like I almost love it when they have a name where I'm unsure how it's pronounced. Okay, and because then I can really say that I'm like, hey, you know, you know, Siphonophore. I hope I'm saying your <laughs> name right. I'm super sorry I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> and, you know, like, and so it's kind of funny. It's, you know, like, it's more like, personal hey, than that. At least this dude's trying. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and now they know for sure. And it's amazing. They love, like, p- people with more unique names, they love it because they're like, oh, you totally butchered it. Yeah. <laughs> you totally, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know what? You were pretty close. Right. Thanks for trying. I'm like, oh, cool. So now you, like, you've already had a little love to the situation. You've broken the ice and you've opened up the conversation, right? Yeah, now, yeah. and the cool thing is now with LinkedIn, especially because now they have how you can, you can, you can record your name to push it yep. on your profile. Now you can go check it out and say, hey, listen, I, I listened to your radio. I hope it's pretty close to how you did it. Oh, wow. wow. I didn't know that. So on LinkedIn, you can re- record your name? I didn't, yeah. I didn't see that. Okay. See, I'm learning something myself tonight. So see, there you go. I'm learning yeah. a lot tonight, actually. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. I actually, when I do the personal videos and email, I've been using Loom, which is pretty good. Have you ever, you've yeah. probably heard of Loom, right? Yep. yep. What do you normally, do, what, what, what do you use if you use, if you do a video email? So video email. So I, I typically like, I mean, so I have a reverse strategy, right? I mean, my strategy is because my business has been around for nine, 10 months. Okay. I focus so heavily on content marketing up front. I okay. literally get I don't know, I get eight to 12 leads a day, every single day into my funnel. Right? Wow. No um, kidding. Because I, I have a formula for lead generation that's automated, right? It, it, okay. it takes time. It takes work to maintain. It wasn't like that overnight, but I built a system up. So I generate leads that go right, right into my funnel and get nurtured, right? Yeah. And so it's very organic. I mean, it, it works incredibly, converts very, very well. Mostly on LinkedIn is, is where you're getting most of your leads? 
So um, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Gotcha. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Well, those are two amazing tips. So, all right, now we're, now we're pushing 40 minutes. So um, again, I can, I can, most of my guests I can chat with for two hours, but no one's going to listen to a podcast for two hours. But uh, Marcus, you've been awesome. So you, you've given us a lot, a lot of stuff to digest tonight. So give me, you know, you met me on the street and, and I said, quickest sales tip you can give me in 10 seconds. What would you say? Oh, the quickest sales tip? Yeah. I'll say, just listen. There you go. Just listen. Yep. Stop talking. Just listen. <laughs> Two ears, one mouth, right? <laughs> That's it. Use That's them accordingly. It. All right, man. Well, Marcus, really, I really appreciate you joining me tonight. This was, this was awesome. Everyone, uh, this was Marcus Chan on Marketing and Sales Over Cocktails. Marcus, thanks again for joining me. Good luck to you. I'm sure we're going to chat again in the future. Uh, I love following your stuff on, on LinkedIn and um, uh, loved your son. He, he actually actually sent a DM with a video DM with his son the other day. So talk about personalization. So the guy's awesome. Look him up on LinkedIn. And before we go, tell people how they can find you. Easiest way is either on LinkedIn, just look me up, Marcus Chan MBA. It's the only guy with Speedos in the tagline. Yes. Or you can also, it's all, 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 as of right now, unless some other Marcus Chan decides to put it in the tagline, which would be weird. <laughs> that's where you can find me right um you can also check out my free private facebook community if you just head to sell more sell better.io it'll redirect you to my free group free training etc all, all so sell me. more sell better.io that's it okay sell more sell better.io marcus chan c-h-a-n on linkedin going from speedos to seven figure contracts is in that's his it. tagline <laughs> that's it i love it marcus thanks very much for joining us and everyone Thank you for joining this episode of Marketing and Sales Over Cocktails. We'll have another great episode coming up next week. Until then, have a great week selling, have a great week marketing, and we'll see you next time.